All right, it looks like we are live. So we'll just give our viewers a few moments to see the notification and join us here for today's live broadcast. But as we're waiting for people to join us, I'm here with Indra Pramit Roy, who's connecting from India today. So it's really wonderful to have you with us here, if only virtually. So um, having been here in person, <laughs> when was it? About 10 years ago as an artist in residence at the Siena Art Institute. Eight. So, oh, yes. Yeah, so it just time is flying by. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully we can have you back in person soon. I'd but, love to. Um, in the meantime, though, it's nice to have this opportunity to digitally connect and to hear a bit about your work and what's um, been going on with your teaching activities as well. So maybe as we're waiting for um, other audience members to join us, I can just um, briefly introduce uh, today's broadcast, which is part of our ongoing series of talks, Starters Live which um, for the months of April and May, we're focusing on the topic of art and education with a special focus on how art educators uh, or in other subjects as well are able to foster creative and critical thinking in different approaches. So as always, we welcome our viewers to use the comment section in the live stream to interact with us, to ask questions, which then we'll be happy to try to respond to at the end of the broadcast. Um, to briefly introduce today's speaker, Indra Prompet Roy studied printmaking at the Tagore University and painting at the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Baroda in India. And then subsequently, he was awarded um, the INLAC scholarship to um, receive his MA in painting at the Royal College of Art in London, which included a term at the Cité d'Art in Paris. And he also spent a term in Berlin on an Erasmus Exchange scholarship um, in a three decade long career. He's had 16 solo shows, um, two duo shows, over 90 group shows, uh, several art camps and workshops that he's organized as well. He's taken part in exhibitions in New York, London, Melbourne, Yangon, and has represented India in the Asian Art Exhibition in Macau and the Cairo Biennale. In 2013, he completed a 12 by 26 foot mural uh, for the Mumbai International Airport. Um, and he's received many honors and fellowships, including the Kanoria Center Fellowship, um, the INLAC Scholarship, the Government of India Junior Research Fellowship, as well as a Fulbright Fellowship. Um, and of course, being able to join us for an artist in residence here at the Siena Art Institute. Um, he has been teaching painting at his alma mater, the Faculty of Fine Arts at Baroda since 1995. And so today's a chance to have a glimpse both into his personal work, but also into his work as an educator. So we'll turn the stage over to you then. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for the kind words and the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> Greetings from India to uh, our listeners, our audience today. And uh, Lisa has been very strict with time. Um, I am an expansive kind of a guy, you know. So start talking, it just goes beyond the time limit. So um, I would definitely try to restrict it within 30 minutes. But um, there are lots of visuals that I'd be sharing. So I hope to um, have your indulgence on that count. And um, before we start with the slides, I would like to say a few words, um, which is <clears throat> about, uh, this talk is supposed to be primarily about art education. Now talking about art education outside in European context needs a little bit of a context. And um, art education in India has a very long history, but in the pre-colonial times, the art education was primarily a sort of master disciple thing, or it was in ateliers and guilds. With the onset of the colonial period of art education, which pretty much started in the 1850s, you had a colonial model schools, which were all modeled after the Kensington School in London. So partly to train people in crafts, um, and the, the curriculum was primarily very academic, which focused on the European manner of drawing um, uh, and also 
the ideals were Greco-Roman. And then you have a third model coming up in the early 1920s, which rebelled against this and wanted to look back at the, the heritage of the country. At the same time, the context, which was changing, which was modern, which was um, tinged with this um, nationalism, a fervor to gain independence from the colonials. So they, these are the three models that we pretty much had. And formal education in pre-independent India per primarily meant that colonial model, with one exception. Faculty of Fine Arts, as you see, was established in 1950, and India gained independence in 1947. So it was the first institute to come up as part of an university setup. So from its day one, it was um, a constituent part of the university. And this was thanks to the vision of our first vice chancellor, who was quite a remarkable woman. You can have one talk devoted to her, because she was a freedom fighter, she was an educationist, she was part of the, the Constituent Assembly, which wrote the Indian Constitution. She also represented India in the UN and um, UNESCO. And it was partly thanks to a vision that this fledgling university incorporated a discipline like Faculty of Fine Arts, which was still considered not fit to be taught in universities primarily. So in that sense, the beginning was very unique. And what is even more so is that the people who came to teach there, their idea of education had a balance of all these three streams that I was talking about. So there was certainly uh, a stress on imparting skills. There was also uh, a sort of nod to the master-disciple relationship. But over and above, it was very forward-looking and modern. And it incorporated East-West the Near East, the Far East, the Middle East, and whatever, you know. So the world of art needed to be looked at. And we basically needed to make artists fit for being creative citizens of a newly independent nation. This was the driving force. And that continued. Why? So uh, the Faculty of Fine Arts became a model, which was emulated by many institutes that sort of opened after that. So this is a, is a very special context in the school that I teach, where I, I studied for a brief period. I did my master's after finishing in Shantiniketan, which was the third model during the colonial period and continued to, it continues till, till today. So these are both, in that sense, alternative educational schools. In the, they're not run-of-the-mill art education schools as far as Indian art education goes. And we have a wonderful campus in the middle of a bustling city. It was a smallish city when it was established, but now I was uh, checking it has 2.2 um, billion population, which is, uh, it's a tier three city. It's not a metropolis. It's not even a tier two city. It's in the third rank, but it's still, it's quite populous. But in the middle of the city, you have a campus which is very green, quiet, conducive to, you know, creative learning. Yes, next, Lisa. So what I'm going to talk about is a bit about the campus and its activities, because I very strongly feel that art education does not happen entirely in the classroom. A lot of it happens in the environment and how people soak that up. And to create that environment is actually inducing creative thinking. You know, uh, in the, one of the talks I heard Lisa talking about critical thinking and creative thinking. And if you think about um, critical thinking, you have to have an awareness. You have to have exposure. You have to have the ability to make comparisons and connections. And of course, ultimately, a structure. Creative uh, thinking that has more to do with play, risk taking, exploration, un exploring uncharted territories. And finally, something that is very crucial, but I'll touch upon that later. I think that that element that every artist is seeking, to quote a great educationist, Ken Robinson. And these are some glimpses of the campus, and this is the house where it all started uh, in 1950. 
Uh, but this is a house from the 19th century uh, and the campus around it and then, then the other buildings slowly came up. There's a painting studio, there is a printmaking studio, there's a big library, there is a auditorium, uh, there is a applied art section which deals with the graphic design and a very big sculpture department and altogether now we have over 400 students combining four years of undergraduate studies and two years of master degree. And we get students from all over the country as well as some countries abroad. Yeah, next. So that's the makeup of the students, very cosmopolitan. These are some views of the campus to give you a sense of the space where I belong and where I do most of my teaching, what I've been doing for the last quarter of a century. Um, that the one on the left is a mural done in a technique called sand casting. It's a symbolic representation of the sun and the lotus pond below. And on the right, you have the sculpture studio, the main studio, and then the, the workshop. Yeah, next. Yeah, this is a printmaking studio. There's a very well-known artist, Indian-American artist. Devraj Dakoji, who was giving a demonstration that's on the right and on the left, a student who is doing stone lithography, a series of them is uh, giving some finishing touches. Next. Yeah, that's the computer section. It's section part of it where people uh, work on uh, the virtual medias. Next. And uh, I'm not even going into the graphic design section. I'm primarily focusing on the painting section. Uh, and this is uh, the sort of undergraduate classes and the teaching involves all those things, demonstration, project work, illustrate lectures, workshops, one-to-one -one guidance, group discussions, outdoor indoor studies, hours of practice. So this is some of the outdoor indoor studies. Uh, there are some workshops that take place. So the, the little image on the right bottom is from a workshop with the body uh, that the students did where they had to trace out uh, the the shape of the body and then make variations of that which was very exciting it went on for two weeks and people had a lovely time so you know it's it's not um, what is good thing about the syllabi here is that the outcome is uh, uh, the 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 uh, purpose of the course uh, the direction of the course is defined, but how one conducts it is left to individual teachers. So you can devise exercises, especially in the undergraduate classes, um, according to your wishes. I am, yeah, next. I am now concentrating more and more in the senior students, uh, the final year BAs, and then the master degree students. Uh, there, of course, uh, it's more kind of one-to-one, -one, as well as group discussions. They are designated spaces which are their studios and they pursue their own researches or visual researches and they usually have an area of interest already developed. Um, so that can work in many mediums as you would see in the coming slides. Yes, this is an undergrad student. Um, this is part of the library. This is a department library. We have a faculty library which has, uh, which is rather biggish. Um, and next. So these are just just quickly go through them. This audiovisual room where we have our um, theory classes, um, lectures, sometimes a small gathering. This is also doubled up as space for uh, workshops and stuff. So it's a multi-usage space. Um, the Student Film Club shows films here on Fridays. Uh, we have a poetry club that often meets here. Uh, and it can seat up to 60 people. We have an auditorium, which is uh, double this size, and which is a little more formal than this. But this is a multi-purpose room that is part of the painting section. Uh, next. Uh, these are some of the workshops. We have a mural design workshop, a ceramic studio, and a photography section. They're attached to the mural design section is attached to painting. The ceramic studio is attached to sculpture. And photography is attached to print painting. So that's how it, it works. But people have the liberty to go and work in other departments. They have optional classes where they can choose to work in other mediums. So it's quite fluid. Next. 
Yeah, then we have a lot of very uh, interesting visiting artists talk that at least um, one every month and sometimes three uh, a month in some months, you know, especially the winter months because summer is rather merciless here. You know, already the temperature is touching 40 degrees, which will be about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, summer is hot. And uh, so we do get a lot of these visiting artists uh, coming, talking. They also make studio visits. They often give their critique to the students. And uh, that is a very long tradition that we have of people coming. And we are fortunately located between two important metros, Delhi and Bombay. So there is a lot of traffic that passes through Baroda. Next. Yeah as is self-evident from the titling. Next. Ah, so we also have these uh, sort of uh, traditional um, artists coming and demonstrating. You know, Ajay Sharma is a very well-known, reputed miniature artist uh, from Rajasthan, which is the next state uh, up north. And he comes and teaches a uh, technique of uh, brushes and special colors and how the drawings are made, how the base of the painting is made. So all these, you know, the technical nitty gritty of it. And we'll see what happens with these workshops because these are not things uh, that are taught as part of the curriculum. These are all extensions of the curriculum. But these are very, very important part, these extensions, because I don't think without that we'll be able to function. So uh, next. Yes, of course. It's not just restricted to the visual art. It covers many things. Next. Yeah, and these kind of clubs and um, societies are, are also a very important part of the campus. Next. And these are some of the facilities that we have. And it is not only used for important shows, but it's also used for students, uh, for trying out things, for their degree shows. Uh, this is one of the venues. <clears throat> and even sometimes for uh, large uh, programs, performances, these spaces can be used. Next. Yeah, that's. Uh, retrospective show of a very important artist, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh, also happened to be one of the founding members of the faculty when he completed his 80th year, three years back. We put up a very large show of his work. So. Next. And the final, um, the biannual Fine Arts Fair is also an opportunity for students to work in a variety of materials and in, in a very playful way uh, where all these departmental divisions are taken away. So the preparation time is almost a month and a half. And then it's uh, usually a two day fair, a uh, lot of footfalls in the faculty. It's also a way of inviting people uh, who are curious about what goes on in the faculty to come and see. So there are serious art exhibitions, but there are also toy making, mask making, puppetry performances, or some other kind of theatrical performances, all kinds of fun and games that happen as in a fair. Uh, but the underlying thing is that one to explore the the creative aspects which are somehow underexplored in the classroom and to to have an interface with the public at large and it serves those purposes very well it's been happening since uh, 1961 so it has a hoary tradition next yeah these are some shots so we can go through them one by one lisa um, yeah, that's the gate, the entrance of the last fair. And they, they are all done by students. There's some rather weird ideas. That was a shadow, shadow puppet show, the, the backstage activities, uh, again, conceived by the students, performed in the fair. It's a story of a baby uh, crocodile who gets lost in the flood. And last, last year, we had a flooding in the city. And there's a river that flows uh, through the middle of the city, which is infested with crocodiles. Um, so that that story meant something for the 
local residents that, that this baby crop gets lost and then finally reunites with the parents nice thank you next yeah that's then we have these nine nights of dance usually in october november which coincides with the navratri celebration which is a religious kind of a festival but in the faculty it's celebrated more as a sort of secular um, social gathering of uh, music and dance over nine nights and everybody participates in it very enthusiastically so that's that's one of the major cultural events in the calendar next um, yes, and then we come to our students. I'll be sharing some shots of the annual degree show, which is one of the most important academic events. After the jury is done, then the show is open to public. And uh, it's open to public for two successive days throughout the day until late in the evening. And uh, that's, again, another occasion where a lot of footfalls happen. And uh, I'm just showing you uh, a very small section of the last few years so that you get an idea of the variety of work. And I'm only concentrating on the painting department. I'm, I'm not covering sculpture or printmaking uh, or you know graphic design. So this will give you a fair idea of the variety of things that students do. Yes, next. Um, yeah. This is a work of a student who is very concerned with uh, skin and body. And you would see their references to crucifixion. Um, she was uh, quite uh, engaged with this exploration for uh, throughout her master degree studies. And this is a section of her final display. Next. Uh, these are works. You see that work on the left you saw that uh, in the earlier slide uh, being made but uh, these are undergraduate works so these couple of things and then i'll move to the master degree degree so they happen simultaneously at the same time yeah next yeah assemblage uh, and painting next what I can't show, yeah, they have these hyper-realistic works. This was painted uh, almost eight feet, so it's a very large work. You can imagine walking into a room with this, just an eyeball of a goat staring at nothingness. Mm. Uh, next. Yeah, this was a mechanized work, which also had a video projection. You can see the screen. I unfortunately can't share any clippings or videos because I don't really have the time. Uh, but, you know, what kinds of things are done, taken up? So it may sound a little retrogressive that, oh, you have a painting department, whereas everybody else is having 2D and 3D. But the painting department has a nomenclature, doesn't really hold people to do only uh, paint on canvas kind of stuff. So it allows people you know, all kinds of image making. Next. Um, there's a student in mural section who worked with fiber and this was the display of 2019 and yes the, the text next yes yeah that's an outdoor installation of a former student um, reflecting the environment it's actually mirrors synthetic mirrors and it's about three story high so it's huge next and that's a guy who also worked in the mural section and uh, learned paper making in in the faculty in again one of those workshops and then took that as his main medium and this is also part of the ma degree show next This is a girl who got very interested in miniature techniques. Uh, and she started by making her own paper, making her own paint. Uh, and of course, the imagery itself has. Uh, but they are very contemporary images and very contemporary issues. It's, um, it's actually looking back at your tradition and reinventing it to use it for a purpose, which is very different from when that medium was first invented, because all these mediums were primarily working for the, the royal court. And uh, 
they had a certain bias they had a had a certain notion of what is uh, to be done and what is not to be done and here you go back you learn that the nuts and bolts of the language and then you kind of reconstruct it for a contemporary usage and that also happened partly because of this exposure to uh, the sort of um, workshop mode which happened for a certain duration and it's besides it's precisely because of these kind of students uh, and how they kind of latch on to these exposures that is very interesting to notice that you know on one hand somebody is taking up video and something very cutting edge and on the other hand somebody is going back to a tradition which is 500 years old and reusing and reinventing it so the spectrum is very wide thank you next yeah um, she's another um, she's um, this is uh, she has passed out a few years back and this is her more recent work and she has also picked up this this filigree work and on paper um, and also the technique used is all very very traditional but the imagery is not next uh, this is an outdoor installation of somebody who is a very socio-politically motivated work of uh, peasants and workers and he actually got people um, actual migrant workers to come and perform in this venue and this was in the evening and as you can see compared to the building they are quite large painted installations um, yeah next yeah so group discussions and one-to-one -one critiques like most places the most important form of teaching in the undergraduate years of course you have a little more structuring where you expose people to material mediums uh, certain techniques but as they move up the ladder we're basically concerning about the ideas and the ability to critically think about it but like i said there is a lot of room for play so both the sides of critical thinking and creative thinking are i think taken care of and i'm i've just gathered this whole set of images to give you an idea of um, of the campus life so to speak and i think that is very important part of the pedagogical model uh, what i was talking about is this ken robinson uh, ideal that you know you you can only be in your element when you are doing three things together and it's very important i feel uh, apart from the play the risk taking the exploration um, and the connections that you make that you, you should be doing what you want to do. And of course, you will also have to do what you can do. You can't attempt to do something that you cannot do. And to find that, these two things are very important. But what is perhaps even more important, or the, the last and the most important one, is that you must be doing what you love doing. So what you want to do is important. What you can do is also very important. And what you love doing and when you do these three things when they come together in what you're doing i think you are set and that in my view is the be all and end all of teaching art and, and if you you get the student to do what they want to do what they can do and what they love doing your job is done next Yeah, these are some shots from our group and individual critics. And that will be the end of the segment. And then I have a very short segment where I'll be talking about my own practice. So, Lisa, can we move? Yeah, that's a workshop of drawing happening. This is a theory class, which is an audiovisual class. Yep. This was visits to exhibitions elsewhere in the city, which I think is also a very important component of the of the teaching. And next is um, a study tour to a sixth century Buddhist cave, uh, rock cut cave site, Ajanta. It's an important world heritage site. So all these things are part and parcel of, of the teaching. And they're all trying to induce in you both critical thinking and creative thinking. And I think, um, that's what is the point of this slide presentation so far. Okay, now I'll move into the last section quickly. Uh, well, unfortunately, now it's all online and this is the state of that studio. 
all the hustle and bustle is gone since 2000 and april 2020 april we did the master's degree show also virtually and uh, well we are hoping for it to reopen and for the time being next we are continuing with uh, online mode of teaching like everywhere else which is not quite the same thing as having students around and physically interacting with them as anybody who teaches in an art school would know and agree but we are making something out of this nothing situation so with that i'll conclude the second part which is the student work and teaching and then quickly go through my own practice my own practice is primarily painting and for the last uh, almost 10 years I've been concentrating in watercolor. That is not to say that I don't work in other mediums. I do. Uh, I love working, um, going away from this. Uh, and when I was in Siena, I was doing these mid-size watercolors, but actually it varies from quite small to mid-size to rather large works. I'll share a few samples. Yeah, next please. This is a view of my studio working space. This was a work from Siena. Uh, or inspired by Siena on the last visit and I'm very fond of Siena and I was um, just recalling yesterday the first time I saw this magical place was in 1992 I was a student on a visit uh, in summer of 1991 I was so enamored that I revisited Siena in 1992 and then I had to wait for almost uh, three decades to make the third visit and thankfully it hasn't changed at all it's as mesmerizing as ever and, uh, next, yeah, that's a slightly earlier body of work. This is um, oil and acrylic on canvas. It's quite large. It's eight feet by six feet. Um, light, as you can see, has been an important part of my work. And urban scapes, uh, light, the drama of it. These are the things that has been with me for a very long time. I'm a very urban person. I grew up in the city of Calcutta. That's where I was born. Um, and um, all throughout my life, uh, I have been engaged with, you know, and you probably have noticed also next uh, that there is no human beings in my work. They are more there in their absence. So there is a lot of human presence. Uh, almost all of them have very strong human presence, but I don't necessarily paint human beings. Uh, this is also a very large watercolor, as watercolors go. It's about... Uh, five and a half feet high and four feet across. It's called the fireworks. Next. This is a rather small work, uh, 24 inches by 18 inches, I think, called chandelier. Next. Water is something that is fascinating me for the last uh, few years you know it's something which is amorphous which has a surface which is reflective so you can play a lot with light but it's also something dark um, inviting i love water i love to swim i like love going into the water but it's also something that contains volume it doesn't have a shape it takes the shape of whatever is containing it uh, and it's it's you know most of this surface of the earth and even most of our body and uh, I believe that Third World War, if there ever should be one, I hope not, uh, I pray not, but it will be fought over water. It's something so essential to life, and yet we are squandering that resource. And um, I, I just find it a fascinating subject to paint. Next. Next. And the other thing that has started happening is the appearance of text in the work. Um, some, they're not necessarily related with the work. And that was enhanced during this lockdown. The first few months of the lockdown, I was completely locked in my home. So I spent a lot of time in my studio, which is in my home. And um, I was actually, when I realized that all the anxieties um, all the worries, all the thoughts that were somehow getting translated into text. But ultimately, I want the text to, to say such certain basic things about what is to be a painter. 
And this one um, talks about the dark times. It's a quote of Bertolt Brecht. I think the next slide has a close up of the text. Yeah, it's something like, would there be singing in the dark times? And there's a question and an answer, and it says, yes, there would be <coughs> singing about the dark times. Excuse me. <coughs> yes, next, please. Yeah, this one also has some text. This was at the beginning of the lockdown. I have done one work a day. It's very small works, but these are not very small works. So I'm just sharing two or three works. Yeah, next. These are, you can read it. That's the bottom text. Next. Next. I don't know if you can read it. It says, stay calm and panic. It reminded me of the philosopher Gizek. Yes. It's called the Ordinary Lies. Yep, next. Well, this last one, I've overshot the time limit, but excuse me. It's again a very large work, um, about uh, 60 inches by 40 inches by watercolor standards. And I just want to end with the text, which is, um, which is a quote basically I found in a book about Philip Guston by his daughter. Musa Mayer. And I think in a way it says it, it, it rings true about many artists. It certainly rings true about my practice. Next. I hope you can read it. I would like you to read it. Yep. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you for sharing such a wonderful glimpse both into your own work as well as the work of your students. And I really appreciate what you are saying about this idea of community, that it's really important not just to focus on the, the curriculum, the syllabi that you're utilizing in your teaching, but also yeah. the, the community that you're forming on your campus and how important that is for the, the education of your students as well. Yeah. There, there were some um, comments that have come in from our viewers. So I, maybe we can just take a, a few minutes to see um, the, the comments that have um, come in. Um, for, for example, um, Miriam, our director, was asking, um, other than the, the fair that you've shown pictures of, um, do students have additional opportunities to engage with local communities through the courses and um, how yes. successful? is that is in terms of a specific um, Baroda approach to community engagement? Yes, the community engagement happens at the level of individuals. It's not a structured part of the course, but they do have something called internship where they can go out of the campus and learn something or they can offer to engage with the community. Um, that is entirely up to them. What we insist on is that you go and do something which is not offered within the four walls of the campus. So if you are a painting student, don't go and tell me that, oh, I'm going to do an internship in printmaking because that's what is available. But if you want to do and work with a, with a local printer who uses um, maybe a lithography press or um, a relief printing, or, or you go and work with a particular community uh, and learn something, then yes. Uh, as far as interventions, that happens at an in, uh, individual level, like that student who, who did those large um, uh, installation projects. He was 
very very keen on doing that and he had all the freedom so he got actually people to come and cook for us in the canteen one day and he had um, a musical program because he found a bunch of people who were migrant laborers but also double up as singers in their spare time then we have um, dealt with uh, making objects for homeless people so there are a whole range of things that that happen you know it's very difficult to name it because uh, every year it's it's so active that you have mm. people coming you have people going out you have people interacting people coming up with some very fine ideas some very crazy ideas and it all usually takes place um, I see somebody saying uh, that Lily Rhodes said, how do your faculty engage students in opportunities to explore many parts of your program? Well, it is, it is structured in a way that the first year that the student has an opportunity to work in all the departments. And then throughout when they choose their specialization in the undergraduate years, they have something called an optional class where they have to choose something. So they can, a painting student can choose an optional in ceramics, pottery, sculpture, or printmaking or photography and so on. And this continues till uh, the, the, the next three years. So yes, that is one of the ways. The other forms is that um, if somebody wants to go and work um, in another department, then usually permission is given um, beyond the class hours, the studios are accessible. Uh, you just need to know somebody there and get your work done. So. It, it, it's not necessarily structured in that way. What is structured, I've just mentioned. But what is unstructured is also quite important. Mm. Well, it's great just to hear about the variety of activities. Um, just a, a quick question from Franca, who had was um, really admiring the layering of your own work, but also your students' work she was really impressed with. And she was just asking how many students oh, are thanks, specifically Franca. enrolled in the painting department currently? Um, uh, we have about 25 to 26 students in each year, so each year. four years, that makes it about 110 or so. Okay. Uh, and then two MA years, that mm -hmm. is another 30, so about 140. It's a great group. And there was a question that came in from Jackie who was um, asking, um, well, first she says it looks like such a great place. Everyone looks so motivated. If there was one thing you could improve on to benefit the student's experience and practice, what would that be? Well, you see, we are a public university after all, and that has its limitations. It's, it's actually run by the central government. There are two kinds of public universities. One is the ones run by the federal government which are better funded um, and the ones run by the state government. So we unfortunately belong to the second category. So I wish there was a little elbow room there to engage more with the, uh, we have, do have some exchange programs. We have one with the, like all the Bozar. Um, we have, we are in the talk of having another one um, with uh, the British Art School. We had one with Leicester, uh, which has sort of fallen through uh, during the pandemic. So we do have those things, but I wish it was, uh, we, we had a little more elbow room because there are certain restrictions of number of students that you have to take from the the locals and uh, from the state, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these things are sometimes, sometimes very good, but sometimes they can be very restrictive. And sometimes uh, changing nomenclature, for instance, becomes very difficult. So you have to slip in things surreptitiously. You don't really bother about the nomenclature. So if you if you have the will, you can do a lot of things. That's what I realized. And money is always a bit of a problem. Uh, I wish there was a little more funding available. I wish we could you could do a few more things with that. So yes, there are there are lots of shortcomings, you know. I don't get me going on that. I have my <laughs> pet peeves. Sure, but it certainly is really impressive, though, to see um, what you are doing uh, despite challenges. And of course, in the current moments, we're you know all hoping that we can, in the near future, go back to. Uh, you know, in fully in-person teaching, um, but obviously needing to be cautious with the current restrictions. So yeah. uh, I know that the situation in India is very difficult at the moment. So we're all very. crossing our fingers that the the near future can be much brighter for everyone around the world. <laughs> 
So, but in the meantime, it's wonderful at least to have these online platforms that we can utilize to to connect with our um, our contacts, such as yourself, as well as to to the audience who's been able to to join us today for the talk. So, in the interest of time, we we probably should wrap up. Although this conversation could keep going for ages, but um, but thank you so much for sharing your work and your students' work with us. We really appreciate it. And, um, thank, and thank you also to our audience um, for being able to join us for the talk. I'll remind everyone that um, every Tuesday in April and May, we're continuing this series um, talking about art and education around the world. So join us the same time next week. We'll have our presenter next week will be uh, the choreographer and multidisciplinary artist and educator Rodney Veal, who will be connecting from Dayton, Ohio in the US. So we hope you can all join us for that as well. So thank you again so much. It's been lovely to connect with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody in the CN Art Institute, uh, to you, Lisa, to Sylvia. I'm very happy to see Miriam, Franca, Jacqueline, uh, and some familiar names here. I can't see all of them, but I know that there are uh, old pals there. So thank you for being there. And thanks, everybody else, for being so patient with it. I hope you to death. Thank you. Good night. Yes, thank you. Take care. <laughs>